Good morning, friends. We're continuing in Pilgrim's Progress. They're in a dungeon. And um, the last portion that we read was on the topic of suicide. And I would like to share that I do not agree with the author's um, writing on that subject. Um, but I also don't believe in censorship. So I did read it, but it is not my opinion. Well, on Saturday... About midnight, they began to pray and continued in prayer till almost break of day. Now, a little before it was day, good Christian was one half amazed, break out in this passionate speech. What a fool, quoth he, am I, thus to lie in a stinking dungeon when I may as well walk at liberty. I have a key in my bosom called promise, that I will, that will I am persuaded, open any lock in Doubting Castle. Then said hopeful, that's good news, good brother, pluck it out of thy bosom and try. Then Christian pulled it out of his bosom and began to try at the dungeon door, whose bolt, as he turned the key, gave back, and the door flew open with ease, and Christian and Hopeful both came out. Then he went out. Then he went to the outward door that leads into the castle yard, and with his key opened that door also. After he went to the iron gate, for that must be open too, but that lock went very hard, yet the key did open it. Then they thrust open the gate to make their escape with speed, but that gate, as it opened, made such a creaking that it waked giant despair, who hastily rising to pursue his prisoners felt his limbs to fail, for his fits took him again, so he could by no means go after them. Then they went on and came to the king's highway again, and so were safe, because they were out of his jurisdiction. Now, when they were gone over the stile, they began to contrive with themselves that they should do at that, what they should do at that stile to prevent those that should come after from falling into the hands of giant despair. So they consented to erect there a pillar, and to engrave upon the side thereof the sentence, Over this stile is the way to Doubting Castle, which is kept by Giant Despair, who despise, despiseth the king of the celestial, who despiseth the king of the celestial country, and destro seeks to destroy his holy pilgrims. Many, therefore, that followed after, read what was written, and escaped the danger. This done, they sang as follows. Out of the way we went, and then we found what twas to tread upon forbidden ground, and let them that come after have a care, lest heedlessness make them, makes them as we to fare, lest they for trespassing his prisoners are, whose castles doubting, and whose names despair. They went then till they came to the delectable mountains, which mountains belong to the lord of that hill of which we have spoken before, so they went up to the mountains to behold the gardens and, and orchards, the vineyards, the fountains of water, where also they drank and washed themselves, and did freely eat of the vineyards. Now there was on the tops of those mountains shepherds feeding their flocks, and they stood by the highway side. The pilgrims therefore went to them, and leaning upon their staves, as is common with weary pilgrims, when they stand to talk with any by the way, they asked, Whose delectable mountains are these, and whose be the sheep that feed upon them? The shepherd said, These mountains are Emmanuel's land, and they are within sight of his city, and the sheep also are his, and he laid down his life for them. Is this the way to the celestial city? asked Christian. You are just you are just in your way. How far is it thither? Too far for any, but those that shall go thither indeed. Is the way safe or dangerous? Safe for those whom it is to be safe, but transgressed transgressors shall fall therein is there in this place any relief for pilgrims that are weary and faint in the way the lord of these mountains hath given us a charge not to be forgetful to entertain strangers therefore the good of the place is even before you i also saw in my dream that when the shepherds perceived they were wayfaring men they also put questions to them to which they made answer as in other places as whence came you and how got you into the way and by what means have have you so persevered therein? For but few of them that begin to come hither do shew their face on these mountains. But when the shepherds heard their answers being pleased therewith, they looked very lovingly upon them and said, Welcome to, to the delectable mountains. The shepherds, I say, whose names were knowledge, experience, watchful, and sincere, took them by the hand and had them to their tents and made them partake of that which was ready at, pre at present. They said, Moreover, we would that you should stay here a while to be acquainted with us, and yet more to solace yourselves with the good of these delectable mountains. They then told them 
that they were content to stay, so they went to their rest that night because it was very late. Then I saw in my dream that in the morning the shepherds called up Christian and Hopeful to walk with them upon the mountains. So they went forth with them and walked a while, having a pleasant prospect on every side. Then said the shepherds to one another, Shall we shew these pilgrims some wonders? So when they had concluded to do it, they had they had them first at the top of an hill called Error, which was very steep on the furthest side, and bid them look down to the bottom. So Christian and Hopeful looked down and saw at the bottom several men dashed all to pieces by a fall that they had from the top. Then said Christian, What meaneth this? The shepherds answered, Have you not heard of them that were made to err by hearkening to Hymenius and Philtus? Philetus. As concerning the faith of the resurrection of the body, they answered, Yes. Then said the shepherds, Those that you see lie dashed in pieces at the bottom of this mountain, are they? And they have continued to this day unburied, as you see, for an example, for others to take heed how they clamber too high, or how they come too near to the brink of this mountain. Then I saw that they had them to the top of another mountain, and the name of that is Caution, and bid them look afar off, which when they did they perceived as they thought several men walking up and down among the tombs that, that were there, and they perceived that the men were blind, because they stumbled sometimes upon the tombs, and because they could not get out from among them. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds then answered, Did you not see a little below these mountains a stile that led into a meadow on the left hand of this way? They answered, Yes. Then the shepherd said, From that stile there goes a path that leads directly to Doubting Castle, which is kept by giant despair. And these men, pointing to them among the tubes, among the tombs, came once on pilgrimage as you do now, even till they came to that same stile, and because the right way was rough in this place, they chose to go out of it into that meadow, and there were taken by giant despair and cast into Doubting Castle, where, after they had been, they had a while been kept in the dungeon, he at last did put out their eyes and led them among those tombs where he has left them to wander to this very day that the saying of the wise man might be fulfilled, He that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Then Christian and Hopeful looked upon one another, with tears gushing out, but yet said nothing to the shepherds. Then I saw in my dream that the shepherds had them to another place in the bottom, where was a door on the, in the side of an hill. And they opened the door and bid them look in. They looked in, therefore, and saw that within it was very dark and smoky, they also thought that they heard there a rumbling noise as of fire and a cry of some tormented, that they smelt the scent of brimstone. Then said Christian, What means this? The shepherds told them, This is a byway to hell, a way that hypocrites go in at, namely such as sell their birthright with Esau, such as sell their master with Judas, such as blaspheme the gospel with Alexander, and that lie and dissemble with Ananias and Sapphira his wife. Then said Hopeful to the shepherds, I perceive that these had on them, even every one, a shoe of pilgrimage, as we have now, had they not? Yes, and held it a long time, too. How far might they go on pilgrimage in their day, since they, notwithstanding, were thus miserably cast away? Some further, and some not so far as these mountains. Then said the pilgrims to one another, We had need cry to the strong for strength. Aye, and you will have need to use it when you have it too. By this time the pilgrims had a desire to go forwards, and the shepherds a desire they should, as they walked together towards the end of the mountains. Then said the shepherds one to another, Let us here shew to the pilgrims the gates of the celestial city, if they have skill to look through our perspective glass. The pilgrims then lovingly accepted the motion. So they had them to the top of an high hill called Clear, and gave them the glass to look. Then they essayed to look, but the remembrance of that last thing that the shepherds had shewed them made their hands shake by means of which by means of which impediment they could not look steadily through the glass yet they thought they saw something like the gate and also some of the glory of the place then they went away and sang this song thus by the shepherd's secrets are revealed which from all other men are kept concealed come to the shepherd then Come to the shepherds, then, if you would see, things deep, things hid, and that mysterious be. When they were about to depart, one of the shepherds gave them a note of the way, another of them bid, bid them beware of the flatterer, the third bid them take heed that they sleep not upon the enchanted ground, and the fourth bid them Godspeed. 
So I awoke from my dream, and I slept and dream again, and saw the same two pilgrims going down the mountain along the highway toward the city. Now a little below these mountains on the left hand lie at the country of conceit, from which country there comes into the way in which the pilgrims walked a little crooked lane. Here, therefore, they met with a very brisk lad that came out of that country, and his name was Ignorance. So Christian asked him from what parts he came and whither he was going. Sir, I was born in this country that lieth off here a little on the left hand, and I am going to the celestial city. But how do you get? But how do you think to get in at the gate? For you may find some difficulty there," asked Christian, "as other good people do," said he. "But what have you to shew at that gate? And the gate should be open to you. I know my lord's will, and have been a good liver." I pay every man his own, I pray, fast, pay tithes, and give alms, and have left my country for whither I am going. But thou camest not in at the wicked gate, the wicked gate, that is at the head of this way. Thou camest in hither through that same crooked lane, and therefore I fear, however thou mayest think of thyself, when the reckoning day shall come, thou wilt have laid at thy charge that thou art a thief and a robber instead of getting admittance into the city." gentlemen ye be utter strangers to me i know you not be content to follow the religion of your country and i will follow the religion of mine i hope all will be well and as for the gate that you talk of all the world knows that that is a great way off our country i cannot think that any men in all our parts do so much as know the way to it nor need they matter whether nor need they matter whether they do or no, since we have, as you see, a fine, pleasant green lane that comes down from our country to the next way into it. Our country, the next way into it. When Christian saw that the man was wise in his own conceit, he said to Hope whisperingly, There is more hopes for a fool than for him, and said moreover, When he, is, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. What shall we talk further with him, or out, or outgo him at present? And so leave him to think of what he hath heard already, and then stop again for him afterwards, and see if by degrees we can do him any good. Then said Hopeful, Let ignorance a little while now muse on what is said, and let him not refuse good counsel to embrace, lest he remain still ignorant of what's the chiefest gain. God saith, Those that no understanding have, although he made them, them he shall not save. He further added, It is not good, I think, to say all to him at once, let us pass him by, if you will, and talk to him anon, even as he is able to bear it. So they both went on, in ignorance he came after. Now when they had passed him a little way, they entered into a very dark lane, where they met a man whom seven devils had bound with seven strong cords, and were carrying of him back to the door that they saw on the side of the hill. Now good Christian began to tremble, and so did Hopeful his companion. Yet as the devils led away the man, Christian looked to see if he knew him, and he thought it might be one turn away that dwelt in the town of apostasy. But he did not perfectly see his face, for he did hang his head like a thief that is found. But being gone past, Hopeful looked after him and espied on his back a paper with this inscription, Wanton Professor and Damnable Apostate. Then said Christian to his fellow, now I call to re remembrance that which was told me of a thing that happened to a good man hereabout. The name of the man was Little Faith, but a good man, and he dwelt in the town of Sincere. The thing was this, at the entering, it, entering in of this passage, there comes down from Broadway Gate a lane called Dead Man's Lane, so called because of the murderers, because of the murders that are commonly done there. And this Little Faith, going on pilgrimage, as we do now, chanced to sit down there and slept. Now there happened at that time to come down that lane from Broadway Gate three sturdy rogues, and their names were Faint Heart, Mistrust, and Guilt, three brothers. And they, espying Little Faith where he was, came galloping up with speed. Now the good man was just awakened from his sleep and was getting up to go on his journey. So they came up all to him and, with threatening language, bid him stand. At this Little Faith looked as white as a clout, and had neither power to fight nor fly. Then said Faint Heart, Deliver thy purse, but he making no haste to do it, for he was loth to lose his money. Mistrust ran up to him, and thrusting his hand into his pocket, pulled out thence a bag of, a bag of silver. 
Then he cried out, Thieves! Thieves! With that, Gilt, with a great club that was in his hand, struck Little Faith on the head, and with that blow felled him flat to the ground where he lay bleeding as one that would bleed to death. All this while the thieves stood by, but at last they, hearing that some were upon the road, and fearing lest it should be one great grace that dwells in the city of good confidence, they betook themselves to their heels and left this good man to shift for himself. Now after a while Little Faith came to himself, and getting up made shift to scrabble on his way. This was the story. But did they take from him all that he ever had? asked Hopeful. No. The place where his jewels were they never ransacked, so those he kept still. But as I was told, the good man was much afflicted for his loss, for the thieves got most of his spending money. That which they got not, as I said, were jewels. Also he did a little. He had a little odd money left, but scarce enough to bring him to his journey's end. Nay, if I was not misinformed, he was forced to beg as he went to keep himself alive, for his jewels he might not sell. But beg and do what he could, he went, as we say, with many a hungry belly the most part of the rest of the way. But it is not a wonder they got not from him his certificate by which he was to receive his admittance at the celestial gate. No, tis a wonder. But they got not that though they missed it not through any good cunning of his, for he, being dismayed with their coming upon him, had neither power nor skill to hide anything. So twas more by good providence than by his endeavour that they missed that they missed of that good thing. But it must needs be a comfort to him that they got not his jewel from him. It might have been great comfort to him had he used it as he should, but they that told me the story said that he made little but little use but little use of it all the rest of the way, and that because of the dismay he had in their taking away his money, indeed he forgot it a great part the rest of his journey, and besides when at any time it came into his mind he began to be comforted therewith, then would fresh thoughts of his loss come upon him again, and those thoughts would swallow up all. Alas, poor man, this could not be but a great grief unto him. Grief, aye, a grief indeed, would it not have been so to any of us? Had we been used, as he, to be robbed and wounded too, then in a strange place, as he was, tis a wonder he did not die with grief, poor heart. I was told that he scattered almost all the rest of the way with nothing but doleful and bitter complaints, telling also to all that overtook him, or that he overtook in the way as he went, where he was robbed and how, who they were that did it, and what he lost, how he was wounded, and that he hardly escaped with his life. But tis a wonder that his necessities did not put him upon selling or pawning some of his jewels, that he might have therewith to relieve himself in his journey. Thou talkest like one upon whose head is to shell to this very day. For what would he pawn them? Or to whom should he sell them? In all that country where he was robbed his jewels were not accounted of, nor did he want that relief which could from thence be administered to him. Besides, had his jewels been missing at the gate of the celestial city he had, and that he knew well enough been excluded from an inheritance there. And that would have been worse to him than the appearance and villainy of ten thousand thieves. Why art thou so tart, my brother? Esau sold his birthright, and that was, and that for a mess of pottage, and that birthright was his greatest jewel, and if he, why not little faith to do so too? Esau did sell his birthright indeed, and so do many besides, and by and by so doing exclude themselves from the chief blessing, as also that caitiff did, caitiff did, but you must put a difference betw betwixt Esau and little faith, and also betwixt their estates. Esau's birthright was typ typical, but little faith's jewels were not so. Esau's belly was his god, but little faith's belly was not so. Esau, Esau's want lay in his appetite, little faith's did not so. Besides, Esau could see no further than to the fulfillment of his lusts. For I, am, for I am at the point to die, said he, and what good will this birthright do to do me? But little faith, though it was his lot to have but a little faith, was by his little faith kept with, from such excre <laughs> kept from such extravagancies, and made to see the prize of his jewels more, and to sell them as Esau did his birthright. You read not anywhere that Esau had faith, no, not so much as a little, therefore no marvel from where the flesh only bears sway, as it will in that man 
where no faith is to resist if he sells his birthright and his soul all and that to the devil of hell for it is with such as it is with the ass who in her occasions cannot be turned away when their minds are set upon their lusts they will have them whatever they cost but little faith as of another temper his mind was on things divine his livelihood was upon that were spiritual and from above therefore to what end should he that is of such a temper sell his jewels had there been any that would have bought them to fill his mind with empty things will a man give a penny to fill his belly with hay or can you persuade the turtle buff turtle dove to live upon carrion like the crow though faithless ones can for carnal lusts pawn or mortgage or sell what they have and themselves outright to boot yet they they that have faith saving faith though but a little of it cannot do so here therefore my brother is thy mistake i acknowledge it but yet your severe reflection had also made me angry why i did but compare thee to some of the birds that are of the brisker sort who will run to and fro in trodden paths by the shell upon their heads but pass by that and consider the matter under debate and all shall be well betwixt thee and me but christian these three fellows i am persuaded in my heart are but a company of cowards would they have run else think you as they did at the noise of one that was coming up coming on the road why did not little faith pluck up a greater heart he might methinks have stood one brush with them and have yielded when there had been no no remedy that they are cowards many have said but few have found it to be so in the time of trial as for a great heart little faith had none and i perceive by thee my brother hadst thou been the man concerned thou art thou art but for a brush and then to yield and verily since these this is the height of thy stomach now they are at a distance from us should they appear to thee as they did to him they might put thee to second thoughts but consider again that they are but journeymen thieves they serve under the king of the bottomless pit who if need be will come into their aid himself and his voice is as the roaring of a lion i myself have, have been engaged with this little faith as this little faith was and i found it a terrible thing these three villains set upon me and i beginning like a christian to resist they gave but a call and in came their master i could as the saying is have given my life for a penny but that as god would have it i was clothed clothed with the armour of proof i and yet though i was so harnessed i found it hard to work to quit myself like a man no man can tell what in that combat attends us but he that hath been in the battle himself that is where we will stop for the day friends have a good day god bless you